Okay, thank you, Tanya. My name is Pete Tanya. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. I hope that you found the presentation and the materials that we shared with you informative and that the examples that we reviewed with you now provided you a good foundation for how your variable pension plan and the changes to your health plan um, will be calculated. So with me on the question and answer uh, panel tonight, we have Bill Sproul. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. So Bill is the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters, as well as the co-chair for all of your benefit funds. Also with me is Maria Kirilenko. She Hi, is nice. from, uh, thank you, Maria. Maria is from Siegel, uh, who is the funds actuary, and uh, Maria is the pension <coughs> expert. And also on my left here, we have Michelle Gramiak. Michelle is the uh, Northeast Health Funds medical manager. So Cassie, why don't you share some of the questions with us? Okay, first question. Can you give any insight into why we are moving to the VPP when the plan is currently in the green zone? Cassie, I'd like to take that one first out and then we'll see if uh, any of our other panelists want to also comment on that. Uh, I think everybody realizes that uh, defined benefit contribution plans have been under attack for probably the last, at least the last 20 years, maybe even longer. And one of the main reasons is because of the unfunded liability that is accrued with those types of plans. And I'm sure a lot of you know, a lot of friends and family members that uh, don't have the fortunate ability to be part of the carpenters union or another trade union or another union for that matter. Most folks do not have a defined benefit and they have what's called a defined contribution. And the reason is because corporations have gotten away from those types of plans. With the variable plan, and I learned a lot about these over the past five or so years going to different educational conferences as a trustee on your funds, all the new money and all the new commitments that we have to the participants are 100% funded once reconciled the following year. So as we've been uh, educating you with the presentation and other things, as the stock market fluctuates, uh, we're going to be able to enjoy uh, the good times, but also take some responsibility if there's an issue with the stock market. And I reflect in the presentation earlier with the opening remarks about 2008, 2009, the Great Recession. It took us 13 years to get back to where we're at now, which is approximately uh, just under 84 percent funded. It's a little bit into the green zone by four points. All it will take is one or two bad years and we could be back in the yellow zone or the red zone. And I don't wanna be a doomsdayer, but uh, it's something that we as participants, as trustees of the fund have to take responsibility for. It's also been extremely difficult for your business representatives to get new employers to sign our collective bargaining agreements. Uh, any employers that come in and want to consider perhaps becoming union, utilizing our members and uh, paying into our fund, really take a hard look at unfunded liability as a decision maker. And if they come in with high profile attorneys, it becomes more and more difficult to get those types of employers to sign when you have a significant amount of unfunded liability and the uncertainty that goes with that. So the variable plan mitigates that. And I hope that uh, what we learn more and more about it moving forward, that uh, you embrace what we're doing. This decision is not uh, just for a moment in time. This decision is to make sure that our pension becomes strong, 100% uh, funded, solvent for many, many generations to come. Thank you, Bill. And just to add to that commentary, as Bill stated in the beginning of the presentation, the, uh, the, the pension fund back in 08 and 09 lost almost 30% funding from the mid 90s to the mid 60s. It's taken 13 years of relatively good years of returns and hours coming into the fund to get back up to halfway to where we were. So one, one year, one bad year can really uh, provide some detriment to a pension fund but it takes a long, lot longer then to recoup those losses. 
So, thanks, Cassie. What's the next question? Okay. What interest rate is the stabilization fund getting? So I can take this one. Sure. Uh, the stabilization fund is all of the money going to the stabilization account is going to be invested the same as the other plan assets. So uh, it will also grow and take advantage of the fund's um, investment strategy. Okay, great. Thank you. How many hours are needed for level one coverage? For level one coverage, uh, you would need 450 hours in that six month time frame. And if you did not meet those hours, we would look back the additional six month period uh, for a total of 12 months to see if you uh, made 900 hours or more. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Once retired, can any accrued pension under VPP also change, go up or down, even in retirement? Yes, that, that, that is correct. Um, the adjustments will not affect any benefits that you have earned through December 31st, 2021, but the benefits that you have accrued after that, so in 2022 and after, uh, will be adjusted even after retirement. And if I, if I could add to that, uh... The stabilization fund, once it's established for a few years, one of the key components of that is to help perhaps offset any bad market years, whether it be for active participants or retirees. So the trustees have the capability under this new plan design where hypothetically, let's say we have a bad year and, and say the pension accrues a negative 2% loss. If there's money in the stabilization fund, or if the trustees make a decision uh, when they're trying to assess uh, what the accrual is actually going to be for actives, they also have the ability to try to mitigate any kind of fluctuation for the retired portion of that benefit. And our goal is to get a very strong and robust stabilization fund in order to be able to do that uh, moving forward into the future. That's part of the intent. Uh, and it's been a topic of discussion at our trustee board meetings as we've uh, ventured towards uh, changing the plan over to a variable plan. Thank you for elaborating on that. I will add one more thing. Um, because the fund's investment strategy is designed to earn on average more than the hurdle rate, more than 5%. Um, there is one big advantage to having post-retirement benefits also be adjusted up or down is that they can go up. And in fact, on average, we expect them to go up. Um, so uh, under a traditional defined benefit plan, you simply receive the same pension perhaps for 30 years while you're retired. Under the VPP, uh, you would actually expect to receive upward adjustments uh, similar to cost of living increases. Great point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If my wife and I are on Medicare, do these changes impact us? There's actually two parts of this question. Uh, no, if you aren't currently on Medicare, these medical changes do not impact you. However, if you are retired and you're under the age of 65 and not on Medicare, uh, then yes, these changes would apply to you starting April 1st, 2022. Okay. Are well visits covered under 9010 plan or are they completely covered by the plan? Uh, it, it, that depends. Uh, there, we do have some free benefits. Uh, that you can utilize at no cost. Uh, I know I did go over that. However, your regular doctor's visits, um, any other visits aside from those 100% uh, covered, then yes, that would be switching to the 9010 coinsurance plan starting April 1st of uh, 22. Okay. Why is the hurdle rate set at 5% and not lower? So the hurdle rate um, could be set lower than 5%, but at that point, um, certain requirements would kick in and the trustees would actually have to adjust some of your benefits um, in order to make that happen uh, to comply with the law. 
um, and also for, for other reasons that um, I think Phil wanted to elaborate on. Today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right now, we have what's called an assumption rate with the way the plan is designed. And our assumption rate is 7.5%. And that's what makes it more and more difficult to try to hit that target every year, the way that the stock market has been acting for the past 10 or 15 years. We've had some good years, but we've also had some flat years and a few years where it's just been around maybe six and a half, seven, not even seven percent or seven and a half percent. So by reducing the rate to what's called a hurdle rate, we actually have, have a great opportunity uh, compared to the other plan. Whereas if we don't make seven and a half percent every year, not only is the fund down whatever that Delta is, but you also add seven and a half percent to that. So an example would be, let's say, uh, let's say the fund only did 2% under the regular plan. And this has happened to us. The reality is, that the fund actually loses nine and a half percent that year. And that's how you get drugged back into the unfunded liability where we could easily, very easily go from green zone back to yellow zone within a couple of poor performance years with the stock market. So having the 5% hurdle rate uh, is an advantage by moving to this plan. And we did have to do some work to maintain the same accrual. Um, we, we had to target out what it's gonna be for 100% funding in the old legacy plan. And in the future, we may have to put uh, a quarter or 50 cents into pension from future contract increases in order to maintain the 1% accrual that you have now. But uh, looking around at a lot of other plans throughout uh, the family of plans that we just have here in the Eastern Atlantic States, for example, some plans, you only get one credit for a thousand hours and then you're cut off until you get to 2000 hours and then you might get two credits with our plan um, dollars paid in based on a percentage. It's it's a very good plan. Uh, for example, right now at our accrual rate, if you're a full time journey person, perhaps working almost all year round with a, maybe three weeks vacation you can earn $100,000 at the scale uh, based on the New Jersey collective bargaining agreement for the commercial rate. That $100,000 in earnings equates to $180 in credited pension for that particular year. Uh, when you look around uh, at some of the other plans, they do not have that, that type of an accrual rate. As a matter of fact, our, our brothers and sisters that uh, left our plan and ended up going uh, from New York, I believe they're at a 0.85 accrual rate now. They had to be adjusted. And there's other plans that are at 0.85 or 0.75. So we're pretty fortunate to be able to switch to a variable, lower our assumption rate to the hurdle rate of 5%, as well as our main objective by doing this was to stick to the 1% accrual. Okay, thank you, Bill. If I'm currently vested in the LPP, will I be vested in the VPP? Yes, uh, your vesting doesn't change. Um, in fact, very little about your plan changes. It's literally just the fact that all the benefit accruals after um, January 1, 2022 can be adjusted up and down, but all the other plan provisions remain the same. And if you are vested, you will remain vested. Okay. So to, to uh, echo the, the presentation, we, we spent a lot of time focusing on the examples on, on the adjustment formula. That really is the only new component to your uh, accrual calculation. And then uh, where the, the returns are, are over or under 5% will provide you a, a, uh, an increase in your accrual or a potential decrease. As a retired member, am I correct that retirees now have dental and eye coverage? Uh, this goes hand in hand with the previous question. So yes, if you are retired and you are under the, the Medicare age of 65, you are entitled to the dental and vision coverage um, as it approaches on April 1st. Again, if you are on Medicare, uh, the dental and vision coverage unfortunately does not apply to you. Is there co-insurance for all benefits now? 
Yes. Uh, starting April 1st, instead of that flat copay amount that you have now of $10 or $100 for emergency room visits, uh, depending on your level, if you're level two, you will switch to the 9010 coinsurance plan for all benefits. Um, or if you're on level one, that coinsurance is the 7030 coinsurance. And Michelle, that's a thousand dollar maximum per family member, correct? On the uh, on the ten percent. That's correct. So if you do have a family, the it's a thousand dollars per person, up to two thousand um, dollars. If it's only yourself on the plan, then that out of pocket maximum is a flat one thousand dollars. And again, you can use your HRA card for both your coinsurance payments and your out of pocket maximums. Okay. So, um, speaking of HRA. Uh, this question says, will the HRA benefit change in any way? No. So the HRA will remain as it is today. Um, the only thing that will be changing is that you will have, you won't be using as much for your dental and vision coverage if you use it now because you will be covered if you're under that level two <laughs> benefit plan. Um, but to answer your question, no, the HRA benefit is not changing. Okay. Will this impact my profit sharing account in any way? Um, so no, the only changes um, that are going to uh, go in effect in 2022 are the changes we described today in the presentation on the on the pension and in April on the health plan. So there are no changes scheduled for the annuity fund. The video says additional benefit contributions will be added to the legacy plan if needed and will not be counted as a contribution. Please explain. Um, so let me answer that one. Um, so we did talk about non-benefit bearing uh, contributions, uh, very limited, uh, only because it doesn't really impact uh, your pension um, or your pension calculation. So um, the trustees, Bill and the trustees have spent a lot of time in designing this variable pension plan um, so that it would provide no impact to the accruals that you earn. Um, so the there, there may have, and um, there will be some contributions that are allocated towards future um, um, increases, but that you won't get the benefit of, but it won't decrease your current accrual calculation or the amount that you would be earning towards your pension accrual. And just to add to what Pete just stated, one of the main objectives of a variable plan, say three or five years out is, uh, Let's hope that things go extremely well with the markets and we don't see any kind of significant corrections or downturns and, and we just hold steady. At some point, if we get the fund up in the 90 percentile as far as the legacy unfunded liability, that gives the trustees the ability to take a look at that amount of money that goes to pay the legacy money and perhaps maybe increase accruals and move it over to benefit bearing rather than non-benefit bearing. And one thing that I mentioned to the delegates at our last couple of delegate meetings that I think a lot of members are, are perhaps maybe misled, and I certainly didn't understand this perhaps in my first 10 years or so in the union, was that everybody that's out there now working and contributing into the fund <clears throat> is actually paying for our brothers and sisters that are home retired and, and our, some of our uh, fallen brothers and sisters that were retired and have passed on. And that's just the way that def defined benefit plans work. That's the way they're structured. So it's imperative that we keep our organization strong, uh, we keep our, our numbers and our work hours strong, and we continue to grow in order to strengthen our fund so uh, we're no different than anybody else, except we're very fortunate that we have a green zone fund we did not need any help uh, from the federal government with the recent stuff that came about with the insolvent plans. Thank God that that did come down the pike, though, because if some of those plans that uh, were extremely large and uh, extremely underfunded went under, uh, there would be catastrophic events around the country. Just an example, um, if the North States or North Central States Teamsters Fund went out. I believe that was to the tune of about $55 billion. And that could cripple the trucking industry in the United States. And that was set to happen sometime around 2024. 
So imagine, even though the trucking industry is predominantly non-union now, uh, raft with a bunch of uh, owner-operator type uh, drivers and things like that, the trucking companies that were involved in that fund that are no longer participating probably would have went under if that pension would have went under. So, uh, you know, we could be proud that we're taking responsibility for our pension and we're doing what we need to do to strengthen it up. Uh, like I said earlier, for many, many generations to come. Yeah. And Cassie, I think we're getting some really good questions here. And this one is probably the more, more technical one for someone to understand the non-benefit bearing. So just to add to, to that, um, just so you know, out of the $9 and $35, uh, $9.35 contribution today, <clears throat> some of that is allocated to paying the current benefits and your current accruals. And some of it goes to pay that unfunded, that 26% uh, unfunded. So as the fund gets to 100% funding level, which is the goal of the trustees, the quicker we get there, the quicker the trustees are able to, as Bill said, then allocate some of that money that's paying off the old unfunding towards new accruals. So that 1% accrual could then be increased to a higher number and then increase your uh, your pensions. And if I can just elaborate on what Pete just said um, regarding some of the $9.35 being allocated to the legacy plan versus some of it being allocated to future accruals, um, you would still be receiving 1% a 1% of contributions accrual rate on the entire $9 and 35 cents. Um, it's not that you're only getting accruals on part of that. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's an additional contribution on top of the $9 and 35 cents, that would be counted as supplemental and would not get the $1 accrual. So when we say part of the $9 and 35 cents is allocated to legacy, um, that is simply an internal accounting type of thing that we use to track how much of that legacy unfunding we have left over. It doesn't actually affect your benefit accruals. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Good point. Okay, thank you. In case you had more than one surgery in one year, regarding the new healthcare out-of-pocket max, is that per year or per surgery? So the out-of-pocket maximums are strictly for plan per plan year. Um, that plan year is from April 1st to March 31st of every year. Uh, so the good news is once you hit your out-of-pocket max and kind of use that as a buffer, the rest of your services, whether it's for medical under independence administrators or behavioral health under mental health consultants, uh, the fund would pick up the remaining balances for your claims for the remainder of the year once you hit your out-of-pocket maximums. Okay. Does level two still have chiropractic service? Yes. So for level two coverage, you still have chiropractic services. Uh, however, it is switching to the 9010 co-insurance plan. Um, and just to advise you, those chiropractic uh, amounts are usually in the 50 to $60 range. So 10% of that you're looking around the to five or $6 range. So it is very similar to the $10 copay structure that you have for regular doctor's visits right now. If I don't use all of the $2,500 dental allowance, does it carry over? No. So the $2,500 per family uh, allowance for dental is per plan year based. So again, that plan year is from April 1st to March 31st of every year. Uh, it is a use it or lose it policy, but it does re-up every year. It does not carry over. Okay. Will the accrual rate change and when? I guess I'll take that one out first. Uh, the accrual rate is not going to change initially for, I, I would estimate, at least several years. Uh, it could change, and what we're striving to do is have it change to the better to where it actually becomes more of an accrual. And once again, we said this earlier, if in fact our reserve fund, our stabilization fund gets uh, quite a few dollars in it and, and we can do things for a rainy day, we could perhaps raise the accrual, but I don't see the trustees 
making any additional accruals at least until the fund is somewhere in the 90 percentile the low 90s uh, you know it's uh, our board consists of both labor and management trustees and we meet quarterly and obviously the contractors have a big vested interest in this because a lot of our employers have many carpenters on their payrolls and they have millions and millions of dollars of unfunded liability at stake here if uh, if we don't do the right things with these funds so we will be analyzing what's going on with the markets and what's going on with our investment returns on a quarterly basis like we do now and our goal is to change the accrual uh, to the positive now god willing we we have good uh investment climate if we hit something similar to 2008 2009 then obviously just like before uh if if a lot of recall one of the austere things that happened to us after the great recession was that we were paying in 14 percent for our pension but we forfeited an additional four percent of that to non-benefit bearing for a period of six or seven years it was and that was how we were enabled to get from 63 percent funded back up into the mid 70s and closer to 80. and at one point a few years ago the trustees decided to uh, pull back on that austerity and we went ahead and we started contributing more money to the pension if you recall we went to 18 and 10 percent to the annuity and that extra 4% going into the pension enabled us with our hours that were ticking up, uh, starting to get much better from the low points we were uh, 10, 11, 12 years ago. That enabled us to go to a higher accrual, uh, lower the non-benefit bearing monies, and, and actually get our, our pension fund back on track where it needed to be. So I guess it was a, a long answer. Our, our goal is to change the accrual to the better a few years down the road when we're in a much better spot. But uh, God forbid something bad happens with the markets, uh, the, the trustees are gonna have to react just like they do on any other fund anywhere else in the country. Okay. okay. Just one more, one more point there. Um, the trustees back in 08 and 09 after the Great Recession had to make the changes to, to the benefits and allocate that 4% that Bill just talked about to non-benefit bearing. For the six years, an average carpenter probably lost about $160, $170 towards his, his uh, pension benefit. So that change there was something that was enacted by the trustees at a time that they had to. This variable pension plan, as, as you saw in the examples, you saw ebbs and flows of it going up and down. They will happen um, and or they will happen organically on an annual basis in small amounts. So you'll see the small amounts go up and, and they'll go up and, and down in these small increments rather than having to do it, as Bill called it, an austere change to um, to your accruals. And now that you back up to one hundred and eighty dollars for someone who works two thousand hours, um, that's set and will hopefully continue. Um, but um, the variable pension plan will adjust that naturally going forward. Okay. Once we receive the EOB and we have a payment due to a doctor, will the HRA credit card be approved for the payment? So the way that, uh, that the reimbursement will work using your HRA with the 9010 or the 7030 co-insurance plan, uh, we ask you to wait for that EOB so you know exactly what you need to pay to your provider. Uh, the best way to do that is submitting your payment via the, the HRA portal. Um, unfortunately, you won't be able to swipe your card because you have nowhere to, to swipe your card at. So um, we do ask that you use the HRA reimbursement form. The easiest way, again, is to use the portal. Um, it'll be the quickest way as well. Um, but you do still have the HRA um, availability for the co-insurance plan. Okay, thank you, Angela. I may retire next year. Am I correct in assuming whatever I accrue will be added to my legacy pension and only that portion will fluctuate? Absolutely yeah. correct. Yes, 
nothing to nothing to add there. <laughs> yeah. that, that's correct. And, Every, and, everything you've earned through the end of yeah. this calendar year will not fluctuate. If you earn any benefits in 2022, that will fluctuate. Okay. 